Good afternoon. It's 101 Eastern and time for Vision, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. I'm your host, Sam Gill. College campuses are a petri dish for our society. They are where an emerging generation spends its formative years. The open spirit of academic inquiry combined with close quarters and a general mixing of backgrounds and experiences is a pressure cooker of social and political experimentation and innovation. Campuses will always be at the vanguard of American life. The question is simply what at any given moment that vanguard is thinking about. A key issue that we are all discussing today in America is how to balance the various values and principles that animate our democracy. In a perfect world, these values are always compatible. In the real world, they can sometimes seem to be in competition. College campuses are at the center of this tension. They are, on the one hand, places where a piety for history and the long stretch of time comes together with a passionately, unapologetically adversarial culture of inquiry. Universities, we believe, are where we go to do battle with ideas in the pursuit of truth. On the other hand, universities are also ground zero for an emerging generation that is thinking differently and critically about the weight of history, about the pain and injury that words can cause, and about the demands of a more inclusive, more pluralistic society. We're not going to be able to tackle these issues comprehensively today, but we are going to be able to open some of them up with two distinguished guests. Dr. Wayne Frederick is the president of Howard University in Washington, DC, the leading historically black university in the US. Suzanne Nassel is Chief Executive Officer of PEN America, a leading human rights and free expression organization. We've got a lot to cover, so we'd love to get right into it. But first, Dr. Frederick, Suzanne, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, likewise. So I, I was, want to sort of get right into it. Um, and I guess I'd like to ask, uh, start with you sort of, Dr. Frederick, which is, you know, whether it's remote, you know, in a time of COVID or, or on the main quad, what are the what is what is what is the discussion about expression um, and engagement been like on your campus? What are the big issues that are on the minds of your student body? You know, um, Howard's DNA is social justice, and as you can imagine, um, from the minute of the outbreak of COVID nineteen, and it was clear that African Americans are disproportionately affected. Um, that DNA, uh, the the phenotypic expression of that DNA, uh, was the concern that we have. Um, and uh, when you follow that up with the George Floyd murder, uh, you then have uh, the, the issue of the civil unrest and systemic racism. And again, that just uh, simply manifests itself as a phenotype from um, our DNA. The thing is that this is what Howard's mission has been about, and therefore it strikes a chord um, with our students uh, and faculty uh, and alum uh, as well. And so the discussion has been about the fact that we are aware that these things have been taking place and that the time has come um, to arrest them and whether or not people leave the stage uh, from this or not, uh, Howard is going to be here uh, continuing to try to address this issue with our research and our scholarship. You know, one of the things that we've certainly seen in discussions about expression on campus and also, uh, and I think also have seen in this moment of, of, of significant attention uh, around, around racial justice is sometimes a generational divide, even among would-be allies, you know, about how they think about this. Is this something that's been pronounced on your campus? Do, do faculty or alums think differently about this legacy of, so interpret this legacy of social justice differently than the current student body? Uh, yes, most certainly. There, there's no doubt about that. Um, the lived experience of the faculty uh, in, in certain generations is very different um, from today's lived experience. Uh, the tolerance that or, or, or perceived tolerance as well um, across the generations is different. And then the tools uh, that are available and can be used to uh, implement and execute and change is different. So when you think of protests and changing protest to policy, um, there's a very different uh, point of view. You've got faculty on this campus um, who were junior faculty or even students at the time of Brown versus the Board of Education, mm. which was a landmark decision where uh, a lot of those mock trials and stuff were done right here on our campus. Our law faculty supported that. So they've seen that, they've lived through that, they, they, they've seen a process come to fruition. And now you have young people who see a broken system um, albeit with fixes from a generation beyond them uh, that hasn't completely solved the problem. And so it's kind of taken a fractured leg uh, with multiple broken bones and they've seen a couple 
you know, parts of it fixed, but they still see the brakes and they want the brakes fixed um, and they want them fixed um, immediately. And I think that that sense of urgency is something that that generation brings that we have to respect as well and give them the tools in order to get that done. Suzanne, you know, you Penn, Penn has been, in, in particular you as a interpreter of the moment, have been, I would say, among the leading, sort of the leading thinkers on on the one hand being you know, unapologetically in favor of the power of the word, of the power of expression. Um, and at the same time, incredibly sympathetic, uh, at least in my reading, interpreters of some of the evolving sensibilities about what kind of constitutes expression and the experience of expression in, in social discourse and sometimes sort of counterpoised with the kind of take no step backwards free speech advocates that are, you know, is an important tradition in, in this country in the 20th century. And I, just sort of for, for those who are less familiar with this issue, you know, what are some of the ways that you have seen young people, particularly on college campuses, just thinking differently about speech than, than past generations? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, it sort of goes back to, I remember it was, it was you know, about four or five years ago, being on a campus at Wellesley at a seminar, free speech experts, and, you know, there are people, kind of renowned people from around the world, and like quite staunch and some libertarian uh, free speech defenders, and there was a student who sort of just got up uh, at one point and said, you know, what would be so wrong about simply emphasizing the idea that people need to use speech conscientiously. Uh, you know, that linguistic conscientiousness, as she put it, you know, should be a principle or an ideal. And kind of looking at her, I thought, you know, this is obviously a bright young woman. Uh, she's no firebrand. She's mature. She's thoughtful. And what she's saying makes sense. You know, and she was sort of encapsulating the views, I think, of uh, students social justice advocates on campus, but in a way she was sort of translating it to this group of experts. And I think what that kind of unlocked for me was the idea that we really have to listen to students. Like they're the rising generation. We don't get to decide what they think. Like ultimately they're gonna be in charge of these institutions. And so we have to engage with the ways that they look at these issues with what's top of mind for them, with the concerns that they wanna drive forward. And so our effort you know, in the in the next the ensuing years has really been to try to articulate free speech principles in a way that will resonate with that rising generation. And that explains how the drive for social justice, racial equality, uh, inclusivity, equity is not at odds with the robust defense of free speech. Yes, sometimes they can come into conflict and there are a lot of difficult issues to parse through in terms of incidents of hateful speech, uh, you know, racial slurs that are sometimes used pedagogically. And so each of those to me has to be kind of analyzed carefully in terms of how can we both drive forward equity and inclusivity and justice, but also uh, respect the robust defense of free speech. And I, you know, I believe fundamentally that these principles can and must coexist and that that, you know, must be the work that we do. So what do you just want to drill down on that? I mean, and I, I sort of, I think of this debate is sort of like making your way through one of Plato's dialogues. Like the first half of the book is all the red herrings. And then they get down to what the real questions are that they're trying to figure out. There are real, there are definitely red herrings in this debate, right? There are state legislators who've got bigger fish to fry that want to spend a lot of time talking about whether people can speak their minds on campus or professors are allowed to teach. Uh, and then of course there are, you know, progressive advocates on the other side who would, who, 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 um, you know, who, who are advancing a sort of a conception of, of speech restriction that really is probably at odds with some of the values either of inquiry or openness. What do you think are from your mind as an expert, what are the real points of tension? What are the real hard cases that we need to spend some time on? That are, hard, that are more difficult to, to figure out. Yeah, I mean, I think one of them is really, is really the impact of hateful speech and the fact that, you know, we know that hateful speech, you know, yeah, in its more uh, kind of florid incarnations, but even at the level of microaggressions, you know, where they're persistent and nagging and sort of dog someone throughout their life can have psychological, academic, and, you know, even according to some studies, physiological effects and you know the sort of free speech discourse we take the position for the most part that you know the best way to deal with that is not through prohibitions on speech uh it's through things like counter speech education dialogue uh, condemnations official condemnations in some cases and i you know one of the things i struggle with is you know there 
moments, I think this is one of those moments in this country, and I, you know, I, I, I do sort of lay uh, a lot of the blame uh, at the foot of the White House, where you know those solutions don't seem quite adequate. And when mm. people sort of come forward and say, yeah, you know, all that's well and good, but you know, we're still you know living in a society where, especially online, you know, white supremacist ideology. Uh, is running rampant and we need to be protected. I mean, the answer I come back to is that, you know, wh what you don't want is government regulation, that that's not the answer for you. You, you know, but, but what I, uh, you know, I'm stuck on is that the other answers we have, you know, as much as they can work uh, in certain circumstances, aren't fully satisfactory either. And I think, you know, I think that's a genuine dilemma. How, how, how have your students and faculty experienced this on campus, Dr. Frederick? I, you know, you're animated by a strong social justice tradition, you're, yet I'm sure there are still dilemmas between students and faculty about the power of words, the power of language, what it means to constitute a university community. Have you run into any of these, uh, any of these conflicts and what have you done to, to work your way through them? Yeah, you know, I, I think it happens on a daily basis because uh, when you think of the pedagogical environment, uh, there's a broad uh, spectrum of, of uh, information and knowledge that needs to be transmitted and the manner in which that's done uh, is critical. Um, whether it's uh, you're looking at it from a linguistic point of view or you're looking at it from a historical point of view. And, and I think that evolution of how uh, we see it, I think is critical, um, especially if it turns into policy. And so sometimes I think when we discuss this issue of, of free speech and uh, even when we discuss hate speech and, and we try to think about what really are the barriers, uh, I think one of our big concerns on this campus is how often does that get translated into some kind of policy, mm. uh, whether it's a policy of laws on the books or it's a policy of the way we live our lives in society. I mentioned Brown versus the Board of Education uh, as an example of a landmark case. However, if you go to the Southern states right now, there are, and actually throughout America, this has been happening um, in increasing um, numbers. They're greater than 75%. Uh, one uh, race uh, schools predominantly uh, throughout America, the number of those has been increasing. As a matter of fact, there is some data to suggest that they are more than prior to Brown versus hmm. the Board of Education. So which means we got a law put on the books uh, to lots of effort. And yet still as a society, we've lived our lives very differently. And so sometimes when we talk about hate speech, it's one thing to talk about, you know, some of the impacts of it. And I agree that there are impacts, psychological and, and personal impacts as well, physiological as um, Ms. Nussel pointed out. I think she's absolutely correct. But I also, want, I also worry about does, how much it really impacts how people live their lives and experience uh, their day-to-day -day living. And that, I think, is where you know, as a country and as a campus, we, we really struggle with trying to make sure that we can regulate that or um, to, to control it in some way or combat it when it's negative. What One of the questions actually coming through from our audience for both of you is, you know, how do you respond to intentional use of hate speech? You know, put aside the, I just didn't know that, which lends itself at least intuitively to the idea of a more open-ended dialogue and a meeting place. You know, there, there, there. Are, certainly, there is speech on campus that's intentional that some regard as hate speech, particularly given the kind of polarization we're experiencing. Maybe Dr. Frederick would like to hear what you think, and then Suzanne want to, would love to hear what yeah. you think. Yeah, you, you know, I think we have to combat it because I think um, it, it is clear when it when it is intentional hate speech. I think it's inappropriate, and and we have to combat it. And like I said, because I think it it can translate into how people live their lives, how people experience their lives, and whether or not there are laws on the books or not it can really push uh, things in a certain direction. And I think you have to combat it. Now, at the same time, on a college campus, you want to encourage critical thinking. So even when it is wrong and it is negative and we don't appreciate it um, and we don't want to see it, we still need to make sure that we create a space where we discuss it in an academic environment and make sure that students also take away something different from it as well. They have to recognize it. They have to recognize that it's wrong and they have to be able to take steps to make sure that we are also protecting them from it. But we have to make sure that they also are willing to be inquisitive enough about it to understand its roots, its origin, and where it may head if it's not uh, managed well. Suzanne? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add, I think, you know, taboos uh, have worked well in, you know, in, you know, in this country and around the world to sort of contain yeah 
noxious attitudes and just the fact that something is socially unacceptable. And those taboos have been loosened and weakened over the last few years in this country. And I think, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, more of a sense of leeway uh, to for hateful speech in some quarters. I think that's very damaging. And we need to buttress those taboos through the expression, including of leaders. I mean, one of the most important things when an incident of, you know, hateful speech happens on a campus is really how the uh, university administration reacts. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there would be administrators of college presidents who would say, well, you know, it's free speech. We sort of throw up our hands. And, you know, one of the things that we've said very strongly at Penn America is, you know, that's not good enough. You could, yeah, it might be free speech. It may be that you can't punish the person, but uh, you could still express a condemnation and a rejection of those sentiments. And that's very important. You know, I think another piece of it is who is doing the speaking. I mean, it's one thing if it's a, a professor, you know, that could impinge upon the right to an equal education. If that, you know, if there's sort of hateful or doxious speech in a classroom or, or derisive uh, or belittling, you know, but if it's a student, let's, you know, there have been a number of incidents in recent weeks with these newly admitted students who are found to have, you know, a tweet or a, a video uh, in which they use a slur and the question comes up, should their admission be rescinded? And, you know, I think, there, there are two sides of that, because on the one hand, look, the university wants to provide an inclusive, welcoming environment for all of its students. And if you're letting people on campus who you know may harbor these attitudes, you know, you're in, endangering that. On the other side, you know, I think about Ibram Kendi's work, and you know, the, he, I think what he's forced us to recognize is like we're all racist, right? So we, we, you know, we now must come to grips with that. We can't deny it. And so you know, it's really no surprise that like a portion, you know, uh, uh, as Dr. Frederick was saying, you know, people grow up in segregated environments. Our schools across the country are um, very heavily segregated. So people who have not had a lot of exposure, who may have, you know, parents and home environments where those racist attitudes that become ingrained are, are never really challenged. And so they're 18 years old and they have you know, particularly if it's an isolated expression as opposed to sort of something pervasive, you know, they have an offhand moment. Uh, you know, where they say something that's offensive and objectionable, you know, should that be it? Should that mean that they, uh, you know, their admission is rescinded and their whole life trajectory is affected? So I think those, you know, those questions are tough. Well, I, th I mean, I think, so, so some of, I want to lift up a few things too, you said too, like, I think one of the classic red herrings is that, that there are a number of people advocating for deviant views to be legitimized on the basis of a free speech argument. And the two things aren't the same. I mean, I think that is just a classic red herring in this debate. Oh, because you're condemning me, we're not, I'm not allowed to speak my mind. It's, no, your view's odious and we're letting you know. Uh, say it as much as you want. I also think pointing to the free speech rights of administrators is a, is a powerful and often overlooked uh, point in this, in this discussion too. And then of course, you know, as you point out, that a lot of what I think a younger generation is asking us to acknowledge is that the subject positions are not all equal coming into these discussions and that you have, there can be some explicit space for that. I do, I want to ask you a bit both about this question of sort of discipline or rescission of offers because I think it points to a bigger challenge for us. Like if we do accept the premise, right, that we are really facing a structural challenge, that we're really all implicated at the level of convention and behavior and disposition, particularly white Americans, then it's going to be really hard to move forward with retributive models of justice, right? You know, there's a reason South Africa pursued a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right? That you had to have a different model of moving forward in which the whole community could see itself or, or people were going to defend themselves, even if they could kind of get there uh, philosophically and emotionally. And are there, are there ways to, to do the work of condemning, of acknowledging, of surfacing how we participate in discrimination without it being a punishment? Are there ways that people can sort of stay in the community uh, in some of these some of these cases? Maybe Suzanne, you first, and then we'd love to hear from you, Dr. Frederick. I mean, I'm curious what, what you, Dr. Frederick will say. I mean, I, you know, I think so. I think in some of these cases, it would be better to you know, have the person take a year off, you know, make sure they do a course or a class or some kind of engagement, and then you know, have them be interviewed about, you know, whether they recognize, you know, what kind of environment they're entering and they have, uh, you know, they're prepared to comport themselves in a, in a way that's going to make other people on campus, you know, feel comfortable and not threatened. So I, I think there are those models. You know, there's also, you know, sort of the point that gets made that, you know, and I think, I think this awareness of the racism that lies within each of us, you know, is actually, uh, a positive thing in that you can recognize like this is systemic, it's structural, it's sort of in the water we drink and, and, and our DNA at some level. 
and that it's not it doesn't necessarily render you uh you know evil or untouchable it may be something you could overcome and there are these stories of you know white supremacists who have been re-educated and who you know have really come to see how you know what a false premise and path they've been uh, uh, sent down, and you know they 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 come around to a very different point of view. So there are those possibilities uh, for reconciliation. I also think there has to be space for you know just outright condemnation. And you know it also depends who the person is. You know where you have people with a prominent platform, you know who uh, reveal that they have ingrained racist attitudes. You know, I think it is important to deny them that platform and for the world to see that, uh, you know, that's not acceptable, that there are consequences, that there is accountability. So, you know, I think one of the difficulties is that there's no kind of single solution for all of this and that, you know, individual circumstances, intent, context, position, power, all of that plays into it. Uh, Dr. Frederick, what do you, have you had to confront one of these issues where someone, you know, past remark, past past behavior is is being is calling into question a, a higher or a or the, or or a matriculating student yeah absolutely uh, and and that happens probably far more frequently than you would think um, you know last year we had an incident where uh, students were threatening violence against administration administrators and uh, employees you know and, and that was unacceptable and some of those students um, ended up being suspended uh, you know for that reason uh, we have to also recognize, though, that uh, part of our responsibility as educators is to create an opportunity for rehabilitation and, and for that formation of the mind. Um, you have a high school student just graduated coming into your environment and they put something out. And the question is, you know, is that person fully formed? Um, does that person have an opportunity to hear and see uh, alternate views. And, and so I think that that is something that we have to take into consideration on a case-by-case -case basis. I think that, um, one of the points that has been made is that uh, one size doesn't fit all. Having said that, uh, I, I do feel very strongly around the condemnation um, aspect of it. I, I think you absolutely have to draw a line. And uh, a few years ago, um, there was a, a young man who um, I, I would say was uh, in involved in some white supremacist, wasn't a student, but put out a, a threat on social media that he was going to come up to Howard's campus and uh, kill a few people. And uh, we pursued that aggressively. FBI finally w was able to hunt him down through his IP address and um, arrested him and he actually served time. And I think it's important that we don't uh, mistake uh, activity like that for free speech because it certainly isn't. And the last thing I would say is um, in the faculty ranks, uh, we also have to be careful because of academic freedom and academic, uh, and academic integrity. Uh, and uh, again, I think that's probably one of the most difficult um, areas for uh, us to really manage and manage appropriately. And it does become uh, quite tricky with faculty, depending on the subject matter, uh, depending on their own history and their own research, as to what um, their speech uh, may be around. And I think, again, you have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. I also think that no single administrator, including the president, and I, I'm pretty sure that my community would be happy to hear this, uh, gets to make that decision as well. You have to have a robust um, area of inquiry with several different opinions weighing in because it's a lens that you just can't see because your own experiences are always going to cloud that to some extent, and you definitely need a circumstance in which others can jump in. And so the last thing I would say is you do need some policing to occur uh, within the environment. So you do want with students, for other students uh, to be able to do some of the management of that themselves. I think to always have administrators jump in is not the solution. You want faculty members to also help um, kind of manage what takes place along, among the faculty ranks. And you want that to be a, a robust debate as well. Well, I think, and I, I think, you know, it sort of speaks to <laughs> Suzanne, your opening comment, like to some extent, the right answer is kind of unsatisfying. We do need to take a lot of this on case by case. You actually have to look at the facts of the case. Um, but you, I think, I don't, you know, you do, I, there's, there's some really, uh, you know, in the theme of dispelling red herrings, you know, some great red herrings dispelled there. Administrators should be proud to stand up for the safety of students. Let's get away from this language of sort of who's being coddled or not. If there are real risks to student safety, you have to take those 
seriously. And I sort of feel the same way about academic integrity. Like the question is, is the argument important to be aired, not what's the subjective experience of, uh, of a student, which is, which is harder to, to account for. I, wanna, I actually want to ask you guys both about sort of another dimension of time in this discussion, which is the, the really active debate about, uh, about monuments and memorials and other sort of physical forms of expression and our intense reaction to them. And, you know, I would say uh, a lot of this discussion, I look at a little bit differently. A lot of this discussion has sort of been about the monument. And I actually look at this moment and it feels to me sort of like post-Soviet republics in 1991, like the form of expression is the action against the monument. And to some extent, I think there's a generation saying, this is our project. You know, our project is to resist a kind of erasure or aggression. I'm not suggesting that that's right, but I, I, think, I think that is the, the, the act is an act of expression. And I, but I'd be curious to know, um, first from you, Dr. Frederick, are you, are you all confronting some of these questions of sort of physical manifestation of history on your campus? Or how are you and faculty and students talking about um, some of these discussions about you know, what monuments and artifacts stay up and which ones need to come down? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's, a, it's an important discussion. However, I, I think it's a starting point on a longer journey. Mm. And that longer journey is, uh, does that then come to policy and uh, societal norms? Do we reframe those? So it's great to take down the Confederate flag as part of the flag of Mississippi. But do we then examine where Mississippi is today? Yeah. And what is the state of race relations in Mississippi? Are there laws on the books in Mississippi uh, that, uh, that are disadvantaging one or the other? Here at Howard, Howard is named after General Oliver Otis Howard. Uh, he was also the third president of the university. He ran the Freedmen's Bureau and was an abolitionist. But he also uh, represented uh, the federal government in, in cases and action against Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And that is a history that we have to confront. That's a history that we're gonna have to, as a, uh, as a university, be transparent and open about and have a robust discussion. Uh, he did great things and, and his starting of Howard and his, um, you know, history of, around freed uh, slaves uh, was, was a very, very positive one and had a very positive impact. But his actions and engagement with Native Americans uh, probably wasn't as uh, glorious a history and resulted in many of them dying and many of them losing their Native lands as well. And we have to, I think, as, as, a, as a university and as a community, be willing to confront that conversation, not drawing any conclusions as to what must happen. And then the last thing I'd say is, uh, you know, on the monuments, uh, as, as we do that, uh, some of these men, and, and I would note that it is largely men, um, have uh, done things that, that aren't uh, great. Should our children learn about that history? Uh, should they be aware of it? Absolutely. But that should not be their, their future, and that should not be uh, kind of where their ultimate journey ends. I think what we need to do as part and parcel of that is to tell a more complete story. And the other thing that has happened, unfortunately, in the telling of those stories is that, that there's been a minimalization of the contributions of African Americans in this country to some of that history as well. I do, I'm gonna wanna go to you, Susan, on this question, but your, your, your remarks do remind me, I, a few years ago, I was uh, I experienced for the first time in Canada a land acknowledgement, and I remember asking some Canadian civic leaders about about land acknowledgements. And what was interesting was it was I said why you know this is an interesting practice. How did this come about? And to your comments about Mississippi, they said, well, we had a big Truth and Reconciliation Commission about our, our First Nations peoples. Um, there were a lot of ideas, including significant redistribution programs, but the easy one to implement was doing land acknowledgements. And so you're but partly optimistic, like we're taking steps that people can embrace and you have to give people steps you can embrace. But of course, that d d does it become something that preempts the more structural maneuvers that, that also need to, need to happen? But Suzanne, how, do, how, have, how have you and Penn been talking about the, some of the actions around monuments, which, have, which I mean, have been some of the most visible forms of expression over the last, uh, last month? Yeah, I mean, we, we don't see it really as a free expression issue. I mean, obviously people, when people are demonstrating, they're exercising expressive rights and those can be infringed upon if the demonstration gets shut down. But, you know, insofar as calling for the removal of a statue, you know, that's not like shouting down a speaker. You know, that's mm -hmm. calling for sort of a cultural evolution or reformation. And so we don't see it as, you know, denying the freedom of speech of the people a hundred years ago, you know, who decided Robert E. Lee should be, you know, on a big pedestal in the middle of Richmond. Uh, 
you know, they made their point. They erected their statue, and now the city of Richmond has taken it down. I think, you know, the symbolism is important. I mean, we can all think of moments, whether it's the Berlin Wall falling or the, you know, statue of Saddam being pulled down, that, you know, those moments of people rising up and sort of saying, this doesn't represent us, these are not the values we want to uphold, this is literally not what we want to put on a pedestal. You know, I think that's very important. And I think, you know, in some ways, the more students, you know, rising generation of students can feel that these institutions reflect their values, that there's a place for them, that it's not just, you know, a, uh, a university that was made for, uh, you know, the students of generations ago who, uh, you know, on some campuses were all white and all male and all, you know, from a certain background, but that the university has really evolved and that you see that, you know, in the portraits that are hung in the lecture halls and the statues on campus and the names of the buildings and the residential colleges. I actually think if we can create a university environment like that, that, you know, we'll see some pulling back of the calls to, you know, silence controversial speech because people will feel more at home, more welcome, more included, more reflected. And I think their tolerance level for, you know, whether it's a microaggression or a contentious idea in the classroom, you know, that, you know, makes them uneasy, uh, brings back some, up something traumatic. I think that's buffered in a way by feeling like you're on a campus that, you know, has made this evolution and that kind of reflects you in these, in these you know, not just the superficially visible ways, but also more fundamental ways, like who's on the faculty and, you know, what are the policies and other things. I think you make a good point that, you know, if it's just window dressing, that doesn't count for all that much. What do you, I mean, but that, I think a lot of the, a lot of the sort of progressive sort of interpretation of where free speech can go, I think turns on what you just said. Which is that you know it's sort of a reassurance to the to the First Amendment you know maximalists. I mean, I'll call them like affectionately, but uh, but uh, which is you know if if you can really recognize in the design of the conversation and the side constraints of the conversation the people's true subject position, then a lot of what we want to see in discourse can happen without being fraught, um, right? If if some if people are really showing up as equals then there, more challenging speech can be on the table because it doesn't bring with it the weight of aggressive, oppressive action. But, you know, is that possible? I mean, what would you, what, what should universities be, in your mind, you know, what should universities be thinking about doing to kind of bring about the, the vision that you just articulated? Yeah, look, I mean, you give me a sort of perfect lead into my book that's coming out later this month that's called Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. And I center it on some 20 principles for how I think in our diverse, digitized and divided society, we can defend free speech you know, in a way that is not gonna be seen as inimical to the goals of a rising generation that is focused on social justice and uh, eradication of uh, racial disparities and racial hatreds. You know, and I think it's it's a series of things, some of which kind of cut against one another. It is being more conscientious with language, but it's also taking into account intent and context when other people speak. It's recognizing who's been excluded from the conversation and taking active measures to draw them in and give them the platform and make sure, you know, they can get paid for, you know, what they write and say. So it's kind of a whole series of things, which is maybe not the the simple answer that, you know, we're all grasping for. I don't think there's a silver bullet here. I think it's kind of an adaptation as a society and, and you know, in terms of how we think about utilizing our free speech, you know, how we respect that of others, uh, you know, when we exercise voluntary restraint, because that's, that's part of free speech too. It doesn't mean you say everything that comes to your mind. You know, it's never meant that. And so, you know, I think there's sort of a confluence of things that we have to keep in mind, you know, as we navigate this and ways in which we have to adjust, but that, it, you know, if we do it, the prize is enormous because we can realize this more equal and inclusive society and also enjoy the freedoms that, you know, are enshrined in the Constitution and that I think I've made this a very vibrant, you know, creative and dynamic uh, society as well and that we don't want to lose. So I'm going to give the last word to you, Dr. Frederick, but when I ask a similar question, I mean, you're, you're a president of a, of a major university in the 21st century confronting these challenges, thinking about how to prepare a next generation. You know, the great, the great universities, as I think, Suzanne, you really articulated well, give forth not just a vision of education, but a vision of society and, and the, 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 the ideals and the practices and the behaviors 
that we want to govern and to lead democratic society. They've given that vision for good or for ill, you know, depending on what you think of the last century. What is your vision when you talk to students, when you talk to faculty, when you talk to administrators about the role of the university, what, what's, what's animating your view on what universities need to, how they need to orient themselves? Yeah, you know, I, I think universities need to be bastions uh, for the truth. Uh, the truth is not always um, accompanied in free speech. Uh, Howard's motto is truth and service. And I think that what we try to do is to instill that truth in students. And then what we want to see them do is to then convert that uh, into service for the good of everyone. And so when we think of uh, th this particular issue of free speech and that critical dialogue that must take place, I absolutely uh, embraced that and envisioned that and absolutely made some decisions that haven't been popular in terms of the types of speakers that I bring to campus. But I think it's critical uh, for our uh, campus uh, to really be able to see that and see the full breadth of the argument, whether you want it or not. But let's not be fooled. We live in a, in a society where uh, 79 to 80% of my students are African-American and therefore they are coming from a circumstance that's very different that you would get on uh, campuses that produce as much uh, research and scholarship as this one does. And so I have to also take in that lens of what has happened to them over the course of time in terms of that continuous weathering of, see, of hearing one opinion, one dominant opinion that also um, has resulted in oppression to them as well. And so that's a slightly, I, I shouldn't say slightly, but a significantly different lens. And I have to take that into consideration that there's gonna be less tolerance uh, for that type of oppressive language and oppressive uh, perspective. And so we have to still be creative to make sure uh, that they get the full formation of what we want them to get. And, and that still involves you know, bringing that up. So part of it is not, I think, to be too heavy handed and, and force that is part of what I think I have learned in my own evolution of it. And part of it is to make sure that you're creating lots of circumstances where the conversations can occur and there can be more organic um, formation of it. And I see it, I, I have a 13-year-old daughter who'll be 14 this month and a 16-year-old son, he just turned 16 last month, and I see it in them. You know, they would, my daughter was doing Huckleberry Finn a couple of years ago in class. Uh, the teacher decided to use the N-word without, mm -hmm. um, you know, as far as she was concerned, really preparing them. And uh, she became a free speech um, advocate in a very different way. <laughs> and uh, that I, I just watched her go through the process of it. And it was fascinating, you know. Um, I, and I had my opinion about it, which was very different from hers. And she stood her ground, you know. And, and I think that now that she's had that experience, when she goes to college, she's going to have a very different experience. But it was handled well. Her school handled it well. The conversation was good about it. And we have to remember that we're getting young people that have had an experience already and we're part of their process and their journey. So we have to be open-minded and flexible about how, how we, we do these things as well. Well, you both provided something very unusual during this moment, which is you addressed a complex problem with sort of thoughtful, nuanced, non-dogmatic answers and hope, <laughs> all, all <laughs> qualities in short supply. So if nothing else, uh, the hope hoarders of our audience are grateful, uh, nuanced hoarders of our audience are grateful to you both as am I. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, uh, her, uh, her book is coming out soon, Dare to Speak, De Defending Free Speech for All. And is that available for pre-order on Amazon? It is, yes, on Amazon and at independent bookstores and bookshop.org. So, uh, you know, please track it down, Dare to Speak. I'm glad you mentioned the latter. So if you have competition concerns about Amazon, you can still buy yeah, this. You can still buy this book. You're not restricted. <laughs> don't, don't stand on, uh, on principle. Uh, and you can also follow Suzanne at Suzanne Nossel. Uh, Dr. Frederick can be followed on Twitter uh, at huprez, uh, P-R-E-Z, uh, one seven. Uh, as usual, we'll send this out along with some other op-eds and, and writing from both of these guests. But uh, Dr. Frederick, Suzanne, I just want to thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for, Thanks having, for having us. Uh, before we go, I want to tell you, as always, about what's coming up on Vision. We're going to have uh, a trio of sh uh, some upcoming shows uh, continuing this, uh, this theme of sort of speech and changes uh, in our democracy. Uh, next week on July 9th, we'll have uh, Marianne Franks uh, talk about online speech. She's a professor at the University of Miami Law School. On July 16th, we're going to hear from American media and technology lawyer Nabia Syed. And on July 23rd, we'll hear from Eugene Volokh, who's a, a law professor who focuses on the First Amendment uh, at UCLA. Uh, as a reminder, this episode is going to be up on the website tomorrow. You can see this episode and any episode on demand at kf.org slash vision. You can email us at vision at kf.org or visit us on Instagram at vision.kf. 
Uh, please stay and take the two question survey. And as always, we're going to end the show to the sounds of Miami songwriter, Nick County. His music is available on Spotify until next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.